Okay, we are now in week three of your workers' comp social security and bankruptcy class. Again, we're continuing with our study of what kinds of debts are out there because if you don't know what kind of debts are out there, then there's no way you're going to understand how to put a case together for a bankruptcy. So we're starting in chapter five. Um, we're gonna do five and six today. Uh, the judicial collection process and execution on a final judgment. So just to re recap, we've gone over different kinds of debts are secured and unsecured. Remember, secured is where we have some kind of collateral. Unsecured is where there's no collateral. Remember that when we have a secured debt, there is some kind of a financing statement that... Um, is filed with the county recorder's office that gives that security holder priority over anybody else who wants to take a security interest in that collateral, right? And we've gone over unsecured, which are typically um, medical bills or typically um, things like uh, credit card bills, okay? Then we've gone through the kinds of liens that are out there that um, are non-consensual. Things like tax liens, things like judicial liens, things, um, things like mechanics and artisans liens. And remember lien, L-I-E-N, is when somebody, because you owe them a debt, takes a security interest in some of your personal property. So the IRS can put in a tax lien on your bank account or can put a lien on your tax refund if you have not um, paid your child support or spousal support, okay? Um, we've talked about the collection process, um, that, there are different, um, that there are different kinds of agencies, a whole industry out there that collects debts and the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. It's important to understand that anybody who is collecting a debt needs to operate within those parameters, okay? So now we're getting into the judicial collection process. So let's say that I don't pay my MasterCard bill and MasterCard says, shame on you, Diane, we're gonna try to collect a debt from you um, and they call me and they comply with the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act and I say go pound salt. I don't owe you anything. Somebody stole my identity. And they say, no they didn't. You went to Nordstrom's and bought bunches of shoes and now you don't want to pay for them. And I say, I've never been to a Nordstrom in my life and we go back and forth. And finally, the debt collector for MasterCard says, you know what, forget it. We're gonna file a lawsuit against you. We're gonna collect the debt through the courts that you owe us. So how does that work? They file an action against me, a lawsuit against me. Sometimes it'll be in small claims court. Sometimes, depending on how expensive the shoes were, uh, they'll file, me, file in just municipal court. Um, and let's say that I can't convince the court that, um, that I don't owe the debt. A couple of important things. Um, understand that when somebody is served with an action saying that you're owed a certain amount of money, um, you're kind of at the mercy of the court when it comes to what a judgment will be against you. Remember, a judgment is an order that the court makes. The court doesn't have to just stick to whatever the dollar amount is that the creditor says you owe. They don't. And typically, they don't stick to that if you don't show up for court. And this happens so often. Right? A creditor will file an action for collection, let's say in small claims court. 
It's less than $5,000. And whoever the debtor is, whoever the defendant who is accused of being a debtor, um, who has reneged on their contractual obligations and not paid their debt, whoever that person is, most of the time doesn't show up for court. It's incredible to me. They don't file a response. They don't show up for court. And the creditor very sits there very patiently until the end of all of the hearings and then says, Judge, they didn't show up. And the judge says, well, you can take a default judgment. You can take a judgment against the debtor. How much do you want? Small claims court, you can go up to $5,000. Every creditor I know will say $5,000. I don't care if you owed $250. The judgment will go on for $5,000 because you didn't show up. Now you owe $5,000 and you owe court costs, which are determined by the state and you owe a filing fee and um, you owe interest which is calculated at a minimum of 18 percent per year wow are you in the hole it stinks now on the flip side the creditor ha now has to collect that judgment and if you didn't want to pay $250, if I said go pound salt for $250, what do you think I'm going to say for $5,000? Really go pound salt. So what is a creditor to do? Well, the creditor is going to um, try to take liens against anything that you owe that you own. What they're going to do is, first of all, send you a notice and say, you know what, you're a debtor, there's a judgment against you, you have to tell me everything that you own. Now, some courts will make you come to court to do that and have a debtor's hearing. Um, some of the times they'll just say, send written questions to the debtor, they'll fill it out, they'll go from there. So let's assume it's just the questions, they're written interrogatories. Um, you are required by law to fill out everything. Yeah, I have a bank account, this is the bank account number. I have a car, this is the VIN number. I have a house, this is where it's located. This is how much I owe on my mortgage. Um, I have a four-wheeler, I have a boat. It's your, it's your legal obligation to disclose everything that you own because you know what the creditor is going to do, right? The creditor is going to say thank you very much and is going to go to your bank account and take out all the money that they can from your bank account and is going to put a lien on your four-wheeler and force it to be sold and put a lien on your house. That's how they collect their judgment. And what they do is they scare you by sending you this interrogatory so that you finally come to the table and say, yeah, I'll pay. Well, where do I write the check? Let me make payments. I owe you $250 and say, no, no, sorry. You don't owe $250. You have $5,000 now. And then you'll settle on $2,000, which is a pretty stinking expensive thing to have to go through. Moral of the story is, pay your bills. So there is some property that a creditor cannot put a lien against, that they can't either force a foreclosure or force a, a garnishment or whatever. Um, so households, in each state is a little bit different. There are exemptions that are built into every state statute on what they can and can't get. Um, but some common ones are they can't put a lien against your household furniture up to $5,000. So pretty much everything that most people own in their house isn't worth $5,000 because what we do is 
we take fair market value, which means how much would you pay for it at Goodwill or at an auction. So pretty much it's impossible to put a lien against your household property. Vehicles, same thing. There will be a cap that they are not allowed to, to take money against. What does that mean? So if I own a vehicle that's worth $5,000 and my state says, well, you have an exemption up to $3,000, um, then the creditor would only be entitled to $2,000. If, if the car got sold, I would be able to take $3,000 and the creditor would take $2,000. Okay, um, retirement funds, there are certain exemptions for that. Um, any kind of payments that you receive for, from child support or spousal support usually are exempted, that they can't be garnished. Social security benefits can't be garnished or levied, okay? Why do we do this? Why are there exemptions? Well, because it doesn't serve anybody any good if when you pay your debts, you're destitute. So if your car gets sold and you don't have a car and you don't have any money coming from the sale of your car, then how are you going to buy another car? Right? Um, and so that, that is why we have exemptions. We really don't want people to be left destitute. It serves a broader public policy not to have that. Okay? And again, exemptions apply to most government benefits like Social Security, um, workers' comp benefits. Usually you can't go after those. Okay? What if I owe a debt, but my property is owned jointly with Mr. Hudson? Well, remember from our other classes that when you own something jointly, that means I own 100% of it and Mr. Hudson owns 100% of it. So if we both own 100% of it, but I owe a debt, the creditor can't garnish or levy or put a lien on anything that I own jointly with Mr. Hudson because necessarily that lien would affect his 100% ownership of whatever it is. So if we jointly own a vehicle, you can't put a lien against the vehicle if it's just my debt. Or if we jointly own our home, can't put a lien against it because we jointly own our home. See where I'm going with that? So that is, you know, one way against... Um, <clears throat> being, you know, the a creditor being able to collect their debt. Um, there are lots of ways a creditor can go after your property. There can be a judgment lien where they put a lien or an ownership claim to ownership for a certain dollar amount on whatever, your car, your home, whatever it is of value. And that means I can't sell my home or my car or whatever without them getting paid. Now remember, let's go back to my example of $5,000. Let's say they put a lien on my house for $5,000. I don't own it jointly with Mr. Hudson. It's just me, myself, and I. And five years from now, I go and sell my house. Interest has continued to accrue on that $5,000 lien. So when I sell my house, if I make any profit at all, off the top of what any profit, let's say I make $10,000 of profit, that base dollar amount of $5,000 for the lien plus attorney's costs, uh, attorney's fees and court costs, plus interest, 18% interest on $5,000 for five years, a couple grand. So probably $7,500 gets paid to my creditor before any profits come to me. Off the top, number one, that's what happens. Yep. 
that alternative dispute resolution is looking a little better now, isn't it? That mediation and arbitration. Um, obviously, it's no good. Okay, a writ of execution is where you go as a creditor and you say, I will take that piece of equipment, I will take that piece of equipment until it all adds up to what the value of your judgment is. Now, in order to do that, you can't just show up at somebody's house and say, hey, I got a judgment here. Gimme, gimme, gimme. You have to file for what's called a writ of execution. You have to tell the court, I know that the debtor owns XYZ. Uh, they're valued at this dollar amount. We need the permission of the court to take possession of those assets. This happens a lot when the debtor is a business and has either inventory that a creditor is going to go in and do a writ of execution on or has machinery you know maybe it's a construction company and they have bulldozers or, or big pieces of equipment and they can do a writ of execution so that you can go so that the creditor can go and just take the bulldozer that's pretty hard isn't it that's pretty harsh again Alternative dispute resolution is looking better. Um, the most common um, way that creditors, in most cases for individuals, will, um, will collect on a judgment is through a writ of garnishment, where you'll go to the court and say, hey, I know that Diane o has bank accounts at these banks and that there's this much money in there. There's an exemption that we can't take 100%, but we can take 80% of it. Can you please give us authority to garnish her bank accounts? It's also called levying against a bank account. And they'll do that. They can also garnish your wages. Let's say that I work at Acme Company. What my creditor who has a judgment lien against me will do is go to my employer and say, hey, every time Diane gets paid, we get 30%. Please cut a check to us and to her. Or please cut a check to the court and the court will distribute it to us and then she can have the rest of the money. It's called a garnishment. And I'm sure you've heard of those. Okay, a wage garnishment is a very common way that especially when there's a small amount of money less than $5,000 where there's a judgment that creditors will access your money okay now let's say that you know I didn't pay four bank four of my credit cards for whatever reason um, whoever gets the judgment lien first wins it's just like with the recorder's office it's a race to see who can get the lien against whatever my bank account my property, my car, whatever it is, whoever gets it first wins. So it is a race. If you're a creditor, you have to move quickly. Um, otherwise, somebody else is going to beat you to the punch. Okay? Um, we've talked about interest, post-judgment interest. Oh, that's really bad. Um, some people will try to fraudulently transfer things to avoid a judgment lien. They think they're really smart and they're not and the court will always smack them. There's a look back period so that if I have a house and I think someone's going to sue me or I'm in the middle of a lawsuit, I can't transfer my property to my daughter for a dollar, right? That's fraudulent because everybody knows my daughter's just holding that property until everything blows over and then she's going to give it back to me. Um, you will get into a lot of trouble if you do that. And it happens all the time. It happens with divorces. It happens with bankruptcies. And it happens just with these kinds of uh, just debtor issues before a bankruptcy is filed. Okay? All right. So that is everything that we're going to go over before we get into an actual bankruptcy. We're going to start that next week. 
but it's important that you understand this whole debt process before we get there because when we do the bankruptcy petition we're going to have to say whether or not there are liens we're going to have to say whether or not there are garnishments there are things we're going to have to do to stop the execution of those liens um, we're going to have to know what is a secured and unsecured debt. We're going to have to know how much a mortgage is worth and how much equity someone has in a piece of property. All of these component parts get put into a bankruptcy petition. And if you don't understand what those are, there's no way you can do the bankruptcy. So we'll stop there. Please look for your assignment and for your discussion assignment. And as always, if you have questions, please contact me. If you're having issues getting things completed, please contact me. We can work something out. I can meet you at the school to go over things. Um, but just stay in contact with me. Okay? And again, thank you very much.